Ushletov, Fear Father Roy Galer, good day, Holland Air Forek and Shaw, and you, a Gashlan Valley of Haklea. I want to welcome you all to St. Patrick's Hall uh, here in Dublin Castle. I want to welcome you particularly to hear this address by President von Rompuy on building the European future. On your behalf, I particularly want to extend a very warm welcome to him on this is a first visit to Ireland in his capacity as the full-time chairman of the council, uh, during which visit he has met with the Taoiseach and the Kenny and of course with President McAleese. And uh, I would want to say that we're particularly grateful, Mr. President, that you accepted our invitation to be here, and all the more grateful in view of the very heavy workload uh, and the demands on your time, which are evident, and not least in this week uh, in which you are preparing for next, the next meeting of the European Council. In fact, so great has been the um, interest in what it is you have to say uh, that we had to transfer the address from the Institute, where accommodation is limited, to this uh, splendid and very gracious facilities here in St. Patrick's Hall in Dublin Castle. And we want to thank the government and particularly the Tornishta for placing the hall at our disposal. Mr. President, I hope that um, being here in the heart of Dublin Castle will introduce you in a very tangible way to the history of the Irish people, an ancient nation and a young state. It was here, on this very spot, that foreign rule was imposed on the Irish people over the centuries. And here too in the yard outside where I received you, that power was transferred from the occupying forces to the representatives of the independent Irish state in 1922. And it's here in this very hall, every seven years, that the inauguration of our president takes place. And under our written constitution, the people are the sovereign power, uh, an obvious reflection of our history. And the president, under the constitution, is both the symbol and the guardian of that sovereignty. By joining the European Economic Community as it then was in 1973, the Irish people voluntarily chose to share elements of their sovereignty with other democratic states in Europe in order to bring about the closer union amongst the peoples of Europe, which makes, of course, your title all the more apt. So I trust that you will understand that we value our sovereignty greatly, and you, I trust you will understand why we so zealously guard it. As someone born into a small state whose sovereignty was violated in the past, you can well understand the strength of our sentiments. And that is why Irish policy inside the European Union has always given primacy of place to the principle of the formal equality of all member states. And that is why we have so consistently defended the community method of decision making. And that is why we are opposed to the emergence of a directoire composed of larger member states. At this very moment, our sovereignty, Mr. President, is more circumscribed than we would ever have believed possible. Be it said, as a consequence of our own folly, not of anybody else's. The threat of a directoire is now more pressing than we have ever previously experienced. The need for solidarity amongst the member states is now greater than we would have anticipated even three years ago. But we recognise that the Union grows organically and that the European Council has taken on progressively has taken on additional responsibilities which lie outside the legislative field and concern matters of high politics, not least connected with economic and monetary union, which is in a sense the driving force of these developments. And we perceive that the union method, as Chancellor Merkel has described it, is the next phase of the evolution of Europe. And these are cogent reasons why we supported the creation of your office and why we welcome you and your appointment as its first occupant. 
The times have dictated, as Johnny Shine said, the person that we need to lead the European Council through the perilous years ahead. And in my, in my view, Mr. President, to the, in your personal characteristics, your professional qualifications, and your personal experience, professional experience as a politician, you satisfy all these requirements. I think on this occasion, fate has been good to us as Europeans. And I truly believe that you have been destined for this role. Ladies and gentlemen, Herman von Rompuy is the true European in the sense he was born in Brussels into the Flemish community. True European in that at secondary school he took ancient Greek and Latin as amongst his major subjects. He went to the Catholic University in Leuven, which has such historic connections with our country, and from which he received a bachelor's degree in philosophy at the early age of 21, later taking a master's in applied economics. Quite a change. He then went into the Belgian Central Bank and afterwards, during the 1980s, was a lecturer in economics in Antwerp and Brussels. He comes from a political family in the Christian democratic tradition, and he entered youth politics before serving in the cabinets of Leo Tindemans and Gerton Gies, and he began his parliamentary career, interestingly, in the Senate in 1988, and became national chairman of his party in that same year, being elected then to the Chamber of Representatives in 95, where he served until two years ago. At the relatively young age of 46, he was the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Budget, serving in two governments led by Jean-Luc de Hanna. And along with Philip Maystadt, who was well known to us, who was then Finance Minister, he helped drive down Belgian government debt from 135% of GDP in 1993 to below 100% in the year 2000 and lower still to 87% in 2007. A good pedigree, you might add, for the task now in hand. He later became Prime Minister in 2008, but only served for less than a year because on the 19th of November 2009, he was unanimously chosen by the European Council to be its first full-time president, an office in which he will serve at least the first term for two and a half years. As we know, under the Lisbon Treaty, the Council has now become an institution of the Union and the full-time president a new constitutional officer of the Union. Incidentally, of course, the European Council is to a great extent the creation of the first Irish presidency of 1976 in which Gareth Fitzgerald played such a prominent and key role. And we are very grateful to you, Mr. President, for the very kind words of appreciation you expressed on Dr. Fitzgerald's death. The task of the President, as Johnny Shine has said, is to ensure that the Council, consisting of 27 heads of state and government, works efficiently and effectively, and to a great extent, with unity of purpose. And his primary role is to create consensus and to build agreement in the pursuit of a common European interest. His style he has described himself, which was mentioned by John Shine, neither a spectator nor a dictator, but a facilitator. And he outlined his philosophy on negotiations, which again Johnny has outlined so well. And he concluded by saying, having said he wanted no losers, that I will consider everybody's interests and sensitivities even if our unity remains our strength, our diversity remains our wealth, he said. As we all know, on becoming president, he was instantly plunged into the sovereign debt crisis. And his great skills as a conciliator were immediately put to good use. His first achievement being the creation of the European Financial Stability Mechanism, and then the European Financial Stability Facility, which provides loans to Greece, Ireland, and Portugal a matter of no little interest to us all. The European Council then asked him next to chair a task force on economic governance, which reported last year in October, and which recommended stronger macroeconomic coordination within the, un within the Union and the strengthening of the Stability and Growth Pact, a pact which was, of course, in the first instance, devised and agreed in this very building. In addition, he has drafted an amendment to Article 136 of the Treaty on the 
functioning of the European Union, which enables a permanent financial stability mechanism to come into place, a matter of profound interest to us all and not on the odd occasion a matter of some trepidation as we contemplate the prospects of that late at night. So I think therefore that this topic on building the European Union reflects his historic perspective of the European project as a process which evolves, as Schumann said, on the basis of you know, a very well-known phrase, on the basis of concrete achievements which first create de facto solidarity. Mr. President, it is now my honour to invite you to address this distinguished audience on building the European future. <laughs>